Hello, Montpelier. Look at you guys, you all showed up. This is amazing, thank you all for coming. All right, we're gonna start with a land acknowledgement to thank um, the land that we're standing on. It's stolen land, it's not ours. Um, so we're gonna just thank the land we're on right now. Just music. Okay. We are the land which has served a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is the home of the Western Abenaki people. We honor, recognize, and respect these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather today. In that spirit, today we will begin by acknowledging that we are guests in this land. We will need to respect and help protect the lands within our use. So we want to quickly introduce ourselves. I'm Marianne Songhurst. I go to Montpelier High School, and I just turned 18. I'm Mandy Abu Aziz. I also go to Montpelier High School, and I'm 18. I am Mary Noel Nalamle Ryby Williams, and I go to UVM, and I'm 20. All right, so coming in, you might have saw the hearts along the lines of the street. Um, and those hearts represent 642 black people who have been killed by the police between the year, um, January 2019 to June 2020. And I don't know about you, but that is a lot of people and that needs to stop. When I hear the phrase, Black Lives Matter, I often think to myself, why should we have to say those words at all? No one should ever have to justify the worth of their life. Today, as we stand here brought together and grieving by the horrific murder of George Floyd, we have a clear reminder of why that statement is so important. I can't help but picture that one day, that could be my two young brothers, Leo and Ronnie, whom I would take any bullet for. We stand here today for all black people who have been murdered by the police. Over 640 in the few months since the beginning of 2019. And many more names have been added to the long list, even in the 12 short days since George Floyd's murder. We are here to honor their names. The violence of cops is very real and has left long lasting consequences on the black community. Police brutality has taken away mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, role models, and leaders, and we will not forget it. But I urge you all to think about the illness of racism as systemic. Holding individual cops accountable for their actions is extremely important, and we must continue to do so. But our work does not stop there. Beating racism means fair trials, equitable sentencing, and justice in every arena. The actions of the cops are the tip of the icebergs. Police violence against black people in America is uncomplicated for many of us to confront and condemn, but police brutality is an indication of an even bigger problem. The illness of racism has not infected only the arm of the police, but has infected the whole body of our country. All of, many, all of the many problems black people face in America today have deep roots that go back hundreds of years. Our lives have never been valued, especially to those of white Americans, by our justice system and beyond. While the history of black people in America is a violent history, it's a history of activism, a history of change, and black people have fought for our rights time and time again. We have persevered and made significant changes in progress. Standing here in protest and memorial of lives lost, we are all the most recent players in a significant history of powerful activism. And so, as we honor black lives taken by police, we must also ask ourselves, what will we, what will we contribute? What actions will we take and what goals will we fight to achieve? We did not come this far to only come this far. Oh. 
So now I'd like to introduce my two amazing, beautiful, strong black brothers, Leo Rebby Williams and Ronnie Rebby Williams. All lives can't matter until black lives matter. All Lives Matter overlooks systematic injustice within the black community. All Lives Matter has been weaponized to silence the cries of the unheard. All Lives Matter promptly ends progress before it starts. To work towards equality for all people, we must start with the advocacy for the most marginalized. everyone. Whew. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I am going to share some demands to honor our pain and passions during this time. These include direct actions that everyone here should actively partake in when it comes to becoming anti-racist in today's world. These demands address black pain and trauma. Okay, these are some of the selective items from a broad list written by community members here in Montpelier. First, we demand the end of police brutality now. Make sure every officer is held accountable for their actions and that they are stripped and unable to work in any position in law enforcement in the country. Two, we demand a civilian oversight board and that their first charge is to investigate, review, and report on every police use of force from the last decade. And here are some demands for white allies. Fund movements and organizations led by black people and people of color who are doing the work in fighting racism and making local and statewide impact. This one is short, but it's really important. Fund healing spaces for black people. Join existing local anti-racist groups who are unpacking their white privilege and showing up for racial justice. And these are for the parents. If you have children, talk to them about race now. They are not too young. Our black parents have to worry about this, our safety in our womb. Work to change policies in your communities and your organizations and give space and voice to those who have been marginalized for too, young, too long. Thank you. Will you all join me in taking a moment of silence as well as kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds to remember those who have been killed unjustly by the police across the country.
So at this time, I would like to invite any black person who wants to be heard. They can take the mic and express what they want to express. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, my name is Mustafa Mohammed. I'm black and I'm Muslim. I'm proud to be one and I'm not a terrorist. It's a challenge. It's a challenge being black every day of my life. And I appreciate everyone that's that's come out here today to support the Black Lives Matter movement. But as you know, history repeats itself. One of your white folks said this, burning an American city to the ground won't bring back George Floyd. Well, I say bombing the Middle East countries won't do, undo 9-11. All right, so you all know what's happening in Minnesota and all the large states, how mostly my people are rioting and looting, right? Well, so to be honest with you guys, I don't really blame them because we have done the speaking, we have done the protesting, we have done the marching. Well, white kills black, self-defense. Black kills white, murder. Black kills black, gang violence. White kills white, accident. Muslim kills white, terrorist. White kills Muslim, mental health issues. It's not just the police, it's the system. It's white doctors killing us. It's white judges giving us life sentences. It's white citizens being able to kill us on the street and getting rewards for it. Destroy the system, do y'all get it? I have a question for y'all white folks. So what do you guys want us to do now? Y'all get mad when we march. Y'all get mad when we kneel. Y'all get mad when we riot. Tell me white people, what exactly does an acceptable protest look like to you? Or can y'all just admit that y'all don't want us to rise at all? Maybe I don't cry, but it hurts. Maybe I won't say, but I feel. Maybe I don't show, but I care. If you have a problem with someone's skin color, you have a problem with the creator. He created us in a multiple of colors so we can appreciate diversity and live in harmony. Don't let anyone tell you. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you who is more superior. Treat people fairly. The Almighty is watching. Put an end to racism and violence. Stop labeling people. We're all par part of Almighty's creation. How difficult is it to be kind and promote peace? It costs nothing. Let's make a con concerted effort to spread this message far and wide. Start by being a living example of it. The greatest lesson you can teach yourself is to be patient. Be patient when you're happy because happiness ends. And be patient when you're sad because sadness too ends. Nothing is constant. Everything, everything is temporary except God, the eternal, the everlasting. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Natasha Eckhart Banning. I'm a mother, a wife, and an educator. I grew up in Worcester, attended U32, and have returned to Vermont to raise my family. I am here today to speak for a young man in my community. He has experienced many instances of ignorance and racism while attending school. 
but the incident I will be sharing took place between him and our local police department. These are his words. This occurred on Saturday, January 8th, between 4.50 and 5.10. Around 4, I had been dropped off at Norwich to shoot around before my game later in the day at 6.30. I made sure I was in my dress clothes and out the door by 4.50. The bus for my game left at 5.15 and I was on time. To make it to the school by then, I walked down Central Street and thought I'd cut some time by taking a bridge behind the senior housing. As I walked down by the police office, I raised my head to a window of the station and noticed an officer looking out at me. Not thinking too much of it, I gave her a wave and a thumbs up as a sign of friendly greeting. Once she didn't react, I realized I was wearing a black hood, black dress pants and black dress shoes. Thinking it might look suspicious, I pulled off my hood, smiled and gave another thumbs up. She then got up, walked out of the room. Not wanting to arouse any suspicion, again, I remained where I was to see if, it was, if she was coming out to see me. After waiting, this officer came out with a dog and immediately asked what I was doing. I let her know I was on my way to my school to catch the bus. She then asked, why was I so close to her car? Feeling attacked, I told her again, I needed to be going because I couldn't miss my bus. I looked back as I walked away and she was still watching me. When I got to the school, I had a minute to spare and I had to explain why I was almost late. After this event happened, this young man's mother, a friend and I, went to talk with the chief of police about the incident. During that conversation, many things became apparent. First, the cops will defend each other no matter what. Two, there is not a clear understanding of the trauma that comes with being black in America. They had no understanding or empathy towards the idea that black people have a very different relationship with the police. Three, there was no understanding of the historical significance of bringing a dog out to question a black man. Four, the mandatory equity training that police currently take part in is not enough. And five, that these police officers did not understand that their impact far outweighed their intent. But what's more important is that this young man was raised to do everything right when interacting with cops. He lowered his hood, he smiled, he gave a thumbs up. He remained where he was so as not to raise suspicion. He politely explained his presence and none of that mattered. None of that was enough. Luckily, he walked away from this incident, but he is not unscarred. He will carry that interaction with him the rest of his life. He will carry with him the knowledge that it didn't matter that he did everything right. It didn't matter that he was innocently walking through a well-lit parking lot. All that mattered was that he was a young black man and therefore he was someone to be suspicious of. And when he went to adults he trusted to help him resolve the situation and we tried to work with the system, it became very apparent that the system didn't support him, it supported the police. This is the reality that black Americans wake up to every day. I have a beautiful nine-year-old son. He was seven the first time. He was stereotyped by another student as being violent because he was black. He is the kindest, most selfless boy you could ever meet. But he's only a few years away from no longer being seen as a cute little boy, but being seen as a suspicious, intimidating, and threatening young man. People clutch their purses when they get on an elevator with my husband. He is met with disbelief when he identifies himself as a manager. He is complimented for being so well-spoken and carrying himself so professionally as if a black man is incapable of this. I watch my amazing daughter, the epitome of black girl magic, and pray that her beautiful spirit won't be doused by the stereotypes that will engulf her as she leaves the safety of our home. Every day I work towards improving the educational system that my kids attend so they can feel safe in their classrooms. I work towards educating my community so we feel safe where we live. And I work with local and state groups to make systemic change. This is why we're here today. We must continue to demand a change in the systems that are currently in place. Our police system must be reformed so that it truly protects and serves all people. Our schools must be reformed so they provide safe learning environments for all students. We must demand change. Black Lives Matter. Thank you.
I guess I want to start off with saying thank you to everyone who's here and just seeing everyone is just kind of overwhelming, but like in a good way. Um, but I do just, I don't know, I guess want to ask if like throughout today when we hear everyone, we just lift up black thought and we leave space for black folks to be, which means like even right now, I would just really like it if we, I could see more black people towards the front. So if we could just make a little shift, that'd be awesome. Um, just because I feel like the poem I'm gonna read, I'd rather read to my brothers and sisters. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I wrote this poem and I guess I dedicate it to my dad who is a black man born in Mississippi. Um, he is like one of the kindest man, men you could ever meet, like has a wonderful heart, thinks nothing but good, but the world doesn't see him as that. And anytime he gets pulled over and I'm in the car, I fear for my life just as much as I fear for his. So I wrote this poem um, back in December. It's called, I Couldn't Imagine a Quiet World. I couldn't imagine a quiet world, seamless silence, with a meaningless perpetual idea of a better life. Disappointment and shade would share the same space. Am I brown for a reason? Is my skin the right season? Surrounded by white guilt, I forget what my voice sounds like. But I yell and I scream and I dream to be seen. Every breath that I breathe is for the ones who can't speak. Their lives were taken from our strong oppression. A revolution to be made from the blood of my ancestors. Here I stand to fight the man. He's wearing all white with a pointed hat. Racism is because of that. I am tired of the stress that comes from this, yet my world isn't silent when I fight the violence. I couldn't imagine a quiet world where we didn't follow our hearts, follow the quilts or, our, or the stars to find a movement for our people. I couldn't imagine a world without Malcolm, Martin, Rosa, and Asada. Our world is loud, but our people are louder. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ash Diggs. It's really amazing seeing so many people out here today. Um, and I've just written down a couple things that I want to share with you. Let me be honest and tell you that I hate it here. I live by a beautiful lake. My sun rises and sets amongst mountains. The air is pure and unpolluted. But when I look at my phone, when I listen to the news, when I make eye contact with those boys in blue, I am terrified. Why are they scared when they see us? Aren't I America? Black people have given the world so much culture, music, the ironing board, traffic lights. I know you know we gave you peanut butter. <laughs> I wish I had more jokes, but I don't. I wish I could thank you for being here, but I won't. Black lives are not worthy of justice and equality because of what they've given the world. They are worthy of justice and equality simply due to the fact that they exist. Black lives matter, there are no parameters. Black men, women, and non-binary folks are here and have always been here. Aren't I America? So non-black people of color and specifically white people, I'm glad you're here, but I will not thank you. Fighting this fight is a moral duty. If you consider yourself a good person, then you are obliged to be here. But let me say unequivocally, I'm so happy you're here. I appreciate you and I love you. And as you're so fond of saying, I see you. <laughs> we need you because when you stand with us united, we are so much stronger. When our voices are together, we can change an educational system that leaves black people behind. We can change a healthcare system that doesn't listen to black people, that has our black women dying during childbirth at rates incredibly higher than white people. We
We can change a system that as a whole has demonstrated over and over again that it hates black people all in the name of justice in the United States. Aren't I America? We are all needed in this fight because don't get me wrong, as we've seen, this is life and death. This is not a passing moment. This is a call to continue protesting until we see real systemic change in this country. All black people want to do is live, but we have been and continue to be terrorized by one of the largest crime syndicates in this country. We need to defund the police. I am not sorry for saying it. You may ask if we defund the police, how will they protect us? I ask, how are they protecting us now? The police are brutalizing people all over the country just for peacefully protesting. They're supposed to protect and serve us. They are failing. Aren't I America? Crime is often a direct result of need and desperation. If we created a world where people were paid the way they should be, given educational environments the way they should be, and cared for by their country the way they should be, we would cut crime like you could not imagine. So when I look at the news and I see the police, all I see are state-funded terrorists. There are other ways to protect our community. I do believe that one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. As many people have said, if one cop commits an injustice and 99 cops turn their heads, then you have 100 bad cops. Defund the police. There are other ways to take care of our community. So as we march, as we protest, I don't want to hear about any of the good ones. I don't want them to protest with us. I want them to quit their jobs. Don't you dare take a knee with me because my knee is a protest and your knee is a weapon. We need a new American dream, a dream that includes every single one of us. Aren't I America? I look in the mirror and think of all the oppression faced by my own family, my Native American great-grandmother, my grandmother who raised four black children in the 50s and 60s in Montgomery, Alabama, my grandfather who was sent to war for this country and came back to racism, my father who was sent to war for this country and came back to the same broken one his father did just like before him, my mother, an immigrant. I think of every black and brown face in this crowd, in this country, who has felt the pain and oppression themselves and with their families, and I feel pain. But I look longer in the mirror and I see that I'm strong. I am, I am something beautiful. I am the melting pot. I am America. I was drafted into this fight the day I was born. I am America. Every step I take is for Ahmaud Arbery. Every breath I breathe is for George Floyd. Every time I open my eyes is for Breonna Taylor, whose murderers are still on the street to this day, freer than me. Every move I make is for every black person senselessly murdered by the police and supremacists whose names I could list on and on. Some we know, a lot more we don't. I see the police fighting us, the disgusting, monstrous president telling them to shoot us. Let me be clear, if you are not with me when I say black lives matter, you are against me. I see them. I see them and I see our country, and this is not America, they are not America. This is not America, I am America. This is not America, we are America. We are America, and we will not be silenced. Many generations before us have fought this fight. They are tired, and they prayed for a better day. It's our turn now. Their eyes are watching God, my eyes are watching you. I'm a little nervous. Um, <laughs> no justice. No, no justice. No what does this mean? Sometimes I'm afraid that the chant is loose uh, is loosely. Sorry. Sometimes I'm afraid that the chant is used loosely without careful consideration for what it actually means. Why are you here? We just chanted no justice, no peace. But didn't we show up for a peaceful protest? Has there been justice? No. 
Who is this protest supposed to be peaceful for? Peace means freedom from disturbance, tranquility, or a state or period in which there is no war or war has ended. As far as I can tell, I am so profoundly disturbed. I certainly do not feel tranquil. And there is a war against our bodies, our souls, and our minds. I ask you again, why are you here? I had a really difficult time trying to figure out what to say and who to say it to today. In fact, I prepared three different statements for today and none of them felt quite right. I asked one of my wise friends for some guidance and she helped me to realize that all my statements centered white people. I began to explore how my message would change if I shifted them out of my focus. So Black Vermonters, this is what I want to share with you today. Growing up here, we are constantly force-fed images of whiteness and ways in which we are told to exist in relation to them. Just as we call on white people to deconstruct their whiteness, we must also do the work to examine who we are as people outside the white gaze and outside the context of racism. What are some false narratives that we've internalized and continue to perpetuate? One of the messaging, uh, one of this is the messaging around peaceful protests. A crucial function of a protest or demonstration is to disrupt an oftentimes distorted sense of peace in order to incite radical and revolutionary change. Therefore, a peaceful protest isn't actually a thing and rather just rhetoric that serves to maintain the status quo and comfort of white people. Nonviolent protesting and community organizing is a very powerful tool for change. However, as Bobby King said, if the only alternative to violence is fear, then you must fight. At the protest in Burlington on Friday, many of you shared that you were living in constant fear, so much so that it is incredibly hard for you to even leave your homes, myself included. So we must fight. I'm working to create a group for black Vermonters to learn how to protect ourselves and our communities any means necessary. My vision so far for the group is to offer self-defense training, gun safety and skills training, and protocols and systems for emergency response. If you are interested, If you are interested in being involved in any capacity or donating, donating money or resources to the group, please find me afterwards and I'll take down your names and numbers. And I have um, a James Baldwin coat that I'd like you all to consider. When the Israelis pick up guns or the Poles or the Irish or any white man in the world says, give me liberty or give me death, the entire white world applauds. When black people say the same exact thing, word for word, we are judged a criminal and treated like, we are judged a criminal and treated like one and everything possible is done to make an example of these bad niggers, so there won't be any more like them. I say, give me liberty or give me death, and you will not make an example out of me and those who choose to join me. Thank you. My name is Brittany Malik, and I am a strong, proudly black woman that calls Vermont my home. I came here today to demand my right to live free, happy, and without fear for myself and the millions of my BIPOC family. I came here today to share the voice of Langston Hughes, an incredible black poet and activist whose words are still relevant to this day and they should not be. I demand that you listen to these words and reflect on why these words still hold so much weight for us, even today. Let America be America again, abridged by Langston Hughes. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. 
Let it be that great, strong land of love, where never kings connive or tyrants scheme that any man should be crushed by one above. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro, bearing slavery, slavery scars. I am the red man, driven from the land. I am the immigrant, clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man, full of hope and strength, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, of power, of grit gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab any way of satisfying our needs, of take work the men, of take their pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the stream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I'm the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered throughout the years. I, the man who sailed across the seas in search of what I meant to call my home. For I am the one who left dark Ireland's shores and Poland's plains and England's grassy lay. And I was torn from black Africa's strands to come here to build a homeland of the free. The free. Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions who have nothing for their pay? for all the dreams that we've dreamed, and all the songs that we've sung, and all the hopes that we've held, and all the flags that we've hung, the millions who have nothing for their pay except for the dream that is almost dead today. Oh, America, let America be America again, the land that has never been yet, and yet must be the land where everyone is free, the land that is mine, the poor man's, the Indian's, the Negro, me who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hands at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who lived in leeches from the people's lives, we must take our land back. Oh yes, I say it plain, America was never America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rake and ruin of our gangster deaths, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plains, all, all of it, the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. Thank you. You may know me, you may not. So let me introduce myself. I am Ethan. I am scared of a lot of things. And this is one of them. I am worried what might happen to me. And I don't want to be. I want to be free. I want to live for now. Hi, I'm, my name is Jules. Um, I'm gonna read a poem to you that I wrote in high school, my freshman year, that was five or six years ago. Um, it's called The Skin I Live In. The skin I live in is mine. It's nothing, it's some, not something you can claim as yours. It's not something for sale, not something to fight over. The skin I live in is black, not as dark as my brothers and sisters in Jamaica, Nigeria, Africa, or anywhere in the world. It's not as dark as the night sky, 
that my ancestors crawled under in order to be free. The skin I live in is mysterious, bewitching, tough, something to be proud of. The skin I live in is a mixture of peace, a mixture of love, rebellion, and history. The skin I live in is tough, as tough as Rosa Parks, as smart as MLK, as strong as Francis Harper, all mixed into one being. The skin I live in is beautiful, a solid cream, proof of the past, a library filled with its own history, a history of people with the same skin as me. It's not something you can claim as yours. It's not something for sale. It's my own layer of strength, my own layer of power, my own layer of skin, the colored skin that I live in. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Mbaye. I'm a senior at South Burlington High School. And I'm gonna read a poem that I wrote in 2016 after the murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Um, but it's still relevant today. Every day I see on my TV, a white police officer kills another man who looks like me. And every day I ask myself, why? What did we ever do to you to make you kill us out of the blue? If anything, we should be harming you, but instead we work to forgive you, even after all the pain and suffering you've put us through. Are you scared of us and what we've accomplished? Are you intimidated by our looks? Or is it because you think we don't belong? Because your views of American haven't moved along? If you take away the color, it's all just life. Stereotypes aren't real. All these lives we've lost to you are starting to make us feel, feel like our lives aren't a whole three-fifths of a person at most. Like our lives mean nothing, so all we can do is sell CDs up and down the coast. But who are you to know what the future holds? Maybe one of us will take part in creating world peace. Now we'll never know, because you pulled the trigger, then released. So officers, I'm not begging not pleading, not screaming, not crying. I'm simply telling you that what you've done is a crime. And you're hurting families, though you may think you're saving them, but really all you've done is murder a couple hundred who will never smile again. So officers, move on. And society do it as well. Because being black, is not a crime. Though we all grow up with that in our minds, no one stops to take the time to realize that underneath my skin, I'm just like you. I have a heart, I have a brain, our organs are all the same, but all you think I am is black, and all you think with black is, you see? All you listen to are stereotypes. Yes, officer, I will put my hands up. And yes, officer, I see your gun. And yes, officer, I have a gun. But no, officer, I'm not going to hurt you. No, officer, I'm just selling CDs. I'm just driving with my girlfriend and child. I'm just going to my apartment. I'm just making eye contact. No, officer, I'm just living my life. The life I was given, the life I have a right to, the life you can't just take away. But you can. Because the life I was given doesn't matter to you. The life I have a right to can be taken away by you, but who are you to take it away? 
And why should I die? Because I'm black. But what is that? Why is black bad? Why is black to be afraid of? Why is white the only race, the only people who deserve to be free? The only people who shouldn't die for selling CDs, for driving with your girlfriend and child, for going to your own apartment, for making eye contact, for wearing a hoodie. And why? Why shouldn't they be charged for taking away the life of a man of color, for taking away the life of a woman of color? Why shouldn't they be charged for actually committing a crime, for doing what they said we did? Yes, they have to live with what they've done, but at least they get to live. Unlike the hundreds of innocent blacks who've died, died at the hands of the officers, died because trained officers felt unsafe. But isn't it your job to save us? Us, the innocent, us, the citizens of the United States. Not us, the white. When duty comes to call, protect us all. Because we all deserve life. Thank you. I wrote and performed this poem on these very steps two years ago, and nothing has changed. And I just want to know when is change going to be here before I can put this poem away and never read it again. This is when a black boy meets the sun. When a black boy meets the sun, when his lungs taste the air for the first time, when his fingers curl around his mother's when he first looks at you with those big, round eyes. When he is cute as hell. When he can be spotted on Instagram with Angelina Jolie. When every single woman wants him in her arms. When he's still wanted. When he's still clueless. You see, when a black boy meets the sun, the same son responsible for his chocolate skin, his nappy hair, the fearful eyes that watch him, the unreported harassment that follows him, the same son that taught him to take every punch beaming. A black boy who radiates sunshine, even in his blackest moments. A black boy always smiles. You see, well, a black boy still gets to be a boy his mama will tell him to never stop smiling, not even when he meets the boogeyman in his closet. She will say, listen to me, don't you ever stop smiling. I never wanna see you frown, not even when you see the boogeyman, the man in blue. I don't wanna see you frowning in your casket. You will leave this world with a smile on your face. Don't you dare cry. You best put a tie in your pocket because you never know when you're gonna need it. Never know when you're gonna have to meet the sun. Because when a black boy meets the sun, it's the most important day of his life. The same sun that gave this black boy everything. The pigment in his cheeks, the beauty stitched into his skin, gave him his smiles, gave him the ability to teach those who are informed, gave him a voice so he can tell them. Tell them black is beauty, black is magic, black isn't something to run from because you can't run from the sun. And this black boy knows it. Even when he is still clueless, when he is still wanted, when he still gets to be a boy, before his innocence is stolen from him, before he is mislabeled due to the streets that will raise him, before he is a threat, before he unarmed is more dangerous than a white man with a semi-automatic, when he's still young and gets a warning shot, when he still gets to live long enough to meet a jury, when he still gets the luxury of being questioned before the execution. You see, when a black boy meets the boogeyman, 
the man dressed exactly how his mama said he would be. Covered in blue, with a star on his chest, gun drawn. Aiming for him, trigger already pulled, sending this black boy to go meet his son. He won't be remembered as a black boy, but a nameless man, a danger, a threat. He'll be able to answer no questions, but at least his mama will see him smiling. At least he'll look nice when he meets the sun. Just please remember this black boy had a name. Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Amid Aubrey, George Floyd. Time will not swallow our black boys. We can't let it. Hello, my name's Damian Garcia, I'm 14 years old, and I go to Cross Book Middle School. We're all here today to remember the lives of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and the hundreds others who were killed by the police. I may not be attacked by the police, stopped on the street when I'm trying to go to school, drive around, go to my home, but I still face racism every day. Teachers in my class have to be, have to be pulled out of the room. I have to get a different teacher. Teachers have to be banned from my classroom because they treat me differently because of the color of my skin. I had to quit the Boy Scouts because every time I got angry because a white kid put a white supremacist symbol on his flag, they tell me to Quiet down, calm down, don't raise your voice. Yet yeah, they're allowed to tell me to pick cotton to fill their pillows, fill their coats, and that's allowed. Is that fair? Is that just? It is our job as American citizens to make sure we all have rights. We are protected by the First Amendment. We have rights. We have to stand up for them. And I want to talk to all the young people out here and the people who aren't here and tell you you don't have to be here just because your friends are here. You don't have to be here because you'll get brownie points for going to a Black Lives Matter rally. You have to be here because your friends, your fellow peers, are being treated differently than you because of the color of their skin. And I want to tell the parents of those kids who aren't here tonight, it doesn't matter. Oh, not tonight, you know what I meant. <laughs> that it doesn't matter what you think might happen, it matters what is happening right now. Let your kids come to these rallies, let your kids know what is wrong. Teach your kids about racism. Teach your kids about bias. We need to know. All right. I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming out here and supporting Black Lives Matter, supporting Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, acting up against white supremacy. All right. 
I just want to say one more thing. I want you to recognize your privilege, even the black people here. We are fortunate to live where we live. We are fortunate not to be stopped in the streets and killed. Remember your privilege. Ashley Laporte and this is my sister Jessica. We did not plan to say anything today but looking around at all of the black faces in the crowd growing up as a black Vermonter we're starting to find our voice here and we wanted to share that today. The last speaker, I didn't catch his name, reminds me of what it was like for us growing up in Stowe, Vermont, as some of the only two black kids there. In many ways, we were surrounded by love, by the love of our very white family, and by the love of our community. But every day, we faced microaggressions and racism that beat us down. And I'm ashamed to say this, but it beat me to want to assimilate. It made me straighten my hair, and it made me wear the right clothes, it made me try to go to the right schools and get the right degree. It made me try to go to the right school and get the right job. And I did that because I thought that maybe when I came to back to Vermont 10 years later, that I would be different. I'd be seen as different. I wouldn't be the poor black kid in our town anymore, but I'd have power simply because I had a title and because I wore the right things and I made the right money. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. Nothing has changed. My sister moved back here two and a half months ago after living five years in Haiti, and the things I had to tell her to prepare for were heartbreaking. And as she waits for more than a year or more for her husband to be allowed to join her in this country, we struggle every day and we're exhausted. I want to speak specifically to the young black girls in the crowd. I see you. I genuinely see you. I'm so thankful that you're showing up for yourself and you're speaking for yourself. It's taken me 32 years to find my voice. You are beautiful. And even though every single day this state will tell you that you don't belong here and that we have to be quiet and that you need to take it when the police scare you in the streets and white people give you looks, you do not have to take it. And every time you think it's going to be easier to stay quiet and to wear the right thing and to get the right degree, I can tell you 30 years later, it won't matter. So as much as it's hard every day, try to find it within yourself to have strength. And as much as you think that your white friends are here for you and they are desperately trying, find black people. <laughs> And you need to lift black people up. They will tell you that it's not okay to look for the black people in the hiring pool at your company. They will tell you that it's not okay to look for black faces in the crowd and pull them up to the front, but we have to do it for each other because nobody else is out there looking for us. Thank you to all the white people who have shown up today. On the one hand, I'm incredibly inspired by seeing how many people are here. And honestly, on the other hand, I'm incredibly disappointed. I came here for the Women's March when Trump was first elected. 89 was shut down. There were people backed in the streets. You could not move. And I recognize that we are in a pandemic but I also recognize that black lives only matter when it's in popular television, when it's part of the conversation. And I ask you, when you go back to your small towns this week, ask your friends, ask your neighbor, ask your elected officials, ask your policemen, where were you? Where are you? Because while we can look around and be proud of the people who've shown up, this is not big enough. It's not loud enough. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hi, um, I recognize that we've been up here for a minute, but I would like to invite this crowd into an exercise. Um, and to start, I want to say that anyone who identifies as black or as a person of color to please not participate. Um, we're here because of two very public police killings in a lot of ways, though I recognize that in Vermont um, we have a lot of work to do as well. Um, but we all know that George Floyd died on his stomach. And for anyone in this crowd who is able-bodied and white, I invite you to take that posture. Please lay down on your stomachs. And if white women, you want to lay down on your backs because Breonna Taylor was killed while she was sleeping in her home, please do. And then I kind of I just want to ask all the people of color to come forward if you feel like it. I can see you now. <laughs> um, um, I'm asking for our white allies in this crowd. I'm going to use that term and encourage you to accept that title. And I'm asking you to take this posture. And I'm not asking my black brothers and sisters and non-binary folk to take this position because we have all in this week, in this month, in our lives. Imagine what it would be like to be killed by the police or by white supremacists while we're trying to go for a job. I grew up in this state and there is an incredible privilege of being here. That we have clean air in so many parts of this state, we're not perfect. But that contributes to my health today. And right now, our country is protesting police brutality and violent deaths. But black and brown bodies have been dying disproportionately from coronavirus from the moment it showed up. Where were the protests when they were dying by the thousands across this country? Reports from cities like Detroit alone thousands. I bet it's uncomfortable to be in these postures. I kind of hope some of you are in a puddle because police officers do not stop to make sure things are nice when they are kneeling on black men's ne necks. I want to thank everyone who has spoken here, and I know there are others that want to speak too. And I actually want to give the mic over before I welcome people to exit from these postures. But I do have to say, as somebody who grew up in this state, the thing that broke my heart is seeing two children so painfully aware of their place in this world. We are loving to applaud the two young boys that came up here, but that is fucked up. It's really messed up. They should not have to be acutely aware of this reality, but it's, this, it's a society that we have chosen to build and chosen to prop up, and we need to reckon with that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Arantha Tulani Farrow, and I grew up uh, in Vermont. That was probably the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me, and I could sit here for hours and talk to you about that trauma. My father was deported because of cannabis and because of racial profiling. So me and my brother grew up without our black cultural reference in a white household in a white state. I right now want to take this moment to, um, to just reiterate the importance of supporting black owned business. 
Right now amongst us, there are many POC people who have direct avenues that you in person, in the flesh, can support. I have big dreams of being able to go and be with my father in Africa. And I have big dreams of being able to bring stolen Africans back to that land. We need to support black uh, business owners. I have worked my ass off to become one of very few, I imagine, uh, POC landowners in the state of Vermont. Mm. People are welcome. I am setting up sanctuary. Indigenous and POC first and everyone else after. I am, I am also going to start saving stolen African animals that are being hoarded up in the corners of Vermont by white people. My company is named Caledonia Cannabis. And again, remember that there are people in the crowd right now that you can support and give reparations to for the trauma that is existing in a white dominated place. Right now, we need to take money from the hands of people who have it and who are clearly not being responsible with it. And we need to redistribute that wealth into the hands of people who will. Bless, bless. Also, George Floyd was a black man but he was also a civilian. I'm gonna ask everybody if they could actually stand back up, please, and thank you, thank you very much. I know that sucked, huh? Big man right here, come here. I need you real quick, absolutely. Damien, I need you to stand like right here, actually. Thank you. If you guys do not get loud for Damien, get loud for Damien. Thank you guys. Damien, I'm gonna have you stand right here. Um, listen, uh, okay, so I don't have much to say. As you guys can see, I don't have any paper in my hand. Um, I've actually been catching paper flying across that way, but other than that, I have nothing. I'm speaking from the heart right now, and that is something that is so hard to do. And somehow, some way, Damien, how old are you? 14. He's 14, and he's able to do it like it's absolutely nothing. The reason I have Damien standing next to me is because I'm a black man that grew up in the state of Vermont. I was adopted at the age of three. I came from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My parents had no clue what it would be like to adopt a black individual and bring them to a state that does not accept black individuals. The idea that Damien is not only growing up and he's socially aware, but the idea that Damien is growing up and he's actually brave enough to call the bullshit out is absolutely amazing. What I am not gonna do is stand up here and not acknowledge the fact that everybody here, everybody that created this, everybody that created this, not only are you brave, not only do you commit to your culture, not only do you commit to people, but what I appreciate the most is you commit to being excellent black people every single day, and I appreciate that.
That's basically it. However, one more time for Damien because what he did was changed everyone's lives here. What he did with his words changed everybody's life. Thank you, buddy. So I'm gonna keep this short and quick. Uh, Damien kind of hit on this and the two sisters that talked before it did too. Uh, I just wanna know who is actually here for the cause and who isn't. I don't want people who are here for the clout and because it's the cool thing to do. Because on May 24th, before George Floyd was killed, were you guys ready to stand up and protest for us then? Because think about this, every day, me and my brothers and sisters, we wake up and, and fight this battle every single day. We deal with this every day. We have to watch this shit on TV, social medias, hear about it all day. We're in a state where we are very outnumbered. Look at this, pro this is a protest for black peace. And this is about the only black we have here. This is all we had to support each other. So I don't, if you're here for the cloud, please, we don't want you here. When you go home tonight, think about that. Cause we deal with this every day. So if you're not here to fight this every day, cause when this is over with, when George Floyd is over with, and it's not the cool thing to do, where are you guys gonna be? Are you gonna go back to your normal lives? Or are you guys gonna be out here protesting with us still? Because... <laughs> this, this doesn't end with a charge or a conviction because we got a charge and a conviction in Chicago with Van Dyke who only ended up getting six and a half years and got out in three years. Is that justice? Not at all. He took a, a child from his parents and, did, and he's out walking on the streets in three years. So it does not end with a conviction. So when this is all over with, I'm hoping to see all of your faces still out here protesting and back in our lives, because black lives do matter. <laughs> I grew up in the state. I grew up in Montpelier, actually. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I was raised by a white single mother. Um, and she, God knows she did the best that she can. God bless her. I love her so much. It has been so hard to grow up in this state without a black role model. Um, and so it has taken a lot of processing. And I would like to read you a, t uh, a poem that I wrote. It's two part. The first one I wrote a couple of years ago, and then the second part I wrote just recently. Two white, two bright lights drive my darkness ahead of me. Niggling thoughts are verified and brought to breath as the distance between us shortens, and I feel damned. He slows to a full stop, and there's no sign. Five foot five, and I'm exposed by street lights, headlights. All of the lights are bearing all of me. It's that naked feeling. The ring of my rape, my rape whistle is shoved too far up my fuck you finger and I hold my breath, bated breaths, waiting breaths, breathe. Was the Americone dream worth this? Loose sweatpants, white band of my Walmart panties illuminated, oh God, what have I done? This is provocation. This is my fault, shame on me. I am told this. And I am told this is my fault. I am told I am who I am. It is just who we are and it is our fault and our fault alone. Tell me that I asked for this. My flannel, more buttons done, un than done, peels and exposes how distress has undressed me. My golden shoulder and a slice of blue lace, and the skin below my collarbone is a confession bared for all. My Irish is showing, but my Trinidadian and Serbian show more. My exoticies corrupt me. My existence implicates me. I know what he wants. He wants control for me to concede my guilt to and to cling to fear as though I should be grateful at all for the light that he's brought to fuel it. I feel oppressive eyes that dance and scan, sinister and red hot on my innocent skin. I feel familiar fractions of a face see from just minutes ago, protected still by privileged glass, tainted with exemption, taking me in, reading my demeanor, my worth. It is null and my life is void. We both wonder. Will I be a threat? 
Will I fight for myself, for who I am and for who we are, for all we've lost and never had? And when did take no shit or run for my fucking life become my sole options? Soul concerning, my soul concern burning me as I breathe, because I breathe, simply because I am. And the longer I breathe, the more I feel like I can't. I don't remember the walk across the red carpet concrete with all lights bearing all of me. Is this enough of me for him? Always keep in mind, don't stumble. He might think you're intoxicated. Don't let your black eyes linger or move too fast. Don't walk so fast, you're moving too fast. But don't slow down so obviously because you're being too obvious. Don't adjust your purse strap like that. You're being suspicious. Look straight ahead and don't look down. Fuck, my potential is showing. That is unacceptable, you have to hide that. Do not incite, do not look like a menace, do not look like a threat. Don't look angry, don't look scared, don't look weak, don't look capable, don't look fierce, don't look like anything that you are. I aim my chin to follow my worth, an aura of fear and fake confidence, while acidity and oral form coats my tongue, thick and licking my amygdala, itching to be spat out on the concrete they want to splayed on. Go ahead, bathe me in your noble blue. Part two. So, prefix, I'm a teacher now. I'm a teacher for the state of Vermont. Thank you. And so, the, the second title of this second part is A Poem to Check My Own Privilege. Black kids need black role models to follow and discuss. What we're shown we should be is unjust. Our image is scarred and encrusted in mistrust. God forbid we adjust our stance because we probably have a weapon to thrust. We're mocked for making a fuss, but we're slaughtered and surplus. Forgive me if I cuss, but you won't let us breathe. And thus, kids need to see themselves accurately reflected in us. They need to make connections of joy and success and have the knowledge that we don't have to be oppressed or take things in jest. Yes, we've progressed, but we still live our lives in a state of constant distress. Still detested, arrested for non-aggression, forced into confession, but every time I address this, I silently question, am I on a self-righteous quest to change perception by being the exception? Nonetheless, is my complexion even black enough to be a part of an accurate reflection? The protection of the white misdirection in the curriculum section occurs with the, school, with the selection of school teachers whose features are akin to the textbook's reach and who can accurately recite the right speech and teach an array of nationally approved attitudes, all the while eluding what they, what they call racial feuds, conveniently excluding all the times we were inhumanely pursued, repeatedly screwed, and viciously devalued, and any hardly and hardly any mention of our resilience and fortitude, we get represented as having lesser aptitude, bigger attitude, or just in need, just grateful to have been freed from servitude. But who will teach if no one was taught? I didn't grow up with people of color around, no brown people to look up to and admire. The situation was so dire, it's not profound that I thought my dad was every six foot bald black man I found. No, honey, that's not your father, was my mother's response when I'd inquire. But what bothers me is what transpired the first time I was in a room with only black people gathered. I was lathered in love and grace. I was a teen embraced in my dad's family space, yet not enough to erase the feeling of being misplaced, not having a sense of space. I felt as though I had slathered on black face and quietly snuck into the place and tried to pretend I was the same race. Should I even have these dreadlocks? My self-doubt is built by teachers who preach to my peers with subconscious fear. Their well-meaning donation to the creation of the black narration is seated in their need to feel freed from their ancestral guilt. And now that spilt into their professions and adapted the lessons, quilting my education and their, and their quest to fulfill personal reparation and steer their conscience into the clear without awaiting direction or truly hearing our pleas, making us feel crazy, wondering if life is just a fever dream. And we demand too much when we ask for equality, but see, they failed to interfere, and frankly, they were too insincere. Because I was 13 when Lacey braced, braced me against a hall, braced me against a locker down the hall, and shocker, she called me a dirty nigger. Does my pale, non-male privilege present a softer edge against which to compare? Because my darker sisters and brothers aren't safe anywhere from the stares and the glares, the hateful adrenaline of fatal blue bullets polluting their air. I was pushed into a locker once, 
but with a furrowed brow, Ben and Jerry's and a bottle of wine at 1209, are the cops really inclined to transform me into a white outline? Or am I just a, a soup, a, am I just assigning a trauma that isn't mine? Why am I up here? Who, who decided I was qualified for this? I feel like an imposter, obnoxiously bathing in my exotic light skin privilege, wondering if my voice is like too whiny and white as I stand here, while communities are pillaged to make room for the white image, demoting genocide to scrimmage. This is genocide. And who am I to think that I'm black enough to talk about this? Yeah, I've had it tough, but I've never felt handcuffs or been handled rough or accused of falsehood or bluff. When look at me, they know this is only a phone. Life in Vermont is all I've ever known, and I'm still prone to throw stones in my own home. I've done things that I don't condone, but the seeds are still sown by the pale tone of everyone's face. Do I worry too much about race? Do I have valuable insight? Do I even belong to this fight? Is my skin dark enough to be part of this space? How can I ever learn to, be, to embrace my sense of self that I've misplaced when I was never given a space? How can I stand here if that's the case and complain that racism isn't as bad for me, a pale-faced wannabe? How can I say this when my darker brothers and sisters are being slaughtered? How can I claim a burden on my psyche? These doubts of identity and self are deeply rooted in the foundation of who I am. Every time they arise, I'm reminded of myself because I never saw myself on that shelf of possibility. I am now what I never had then. And when I look in the mirror, I say again and again, I am not perfection, but I have affection for my complexion. Black brothers and sisters, I would like you to repeat after me. I am not perfection, I am not perfection. but I have affection for my complexion. I am not perfection, but I have affection for my complexion. And we, we can now be a reflection for other lost girls who hate their curls with skin the color of a latte and button noses with freckles and complicated hair regimens who hear again and again, I'm darker than you, from their white friends who really just mean well in the end, but we do not want to hear that. Who talk like super white, but still can't pretend to blend or fit the trends. We can't sing or dance or ball. And if that's our value, what then? And for as long as we can recall, our names have been re relentlessly mispronounced every fall. Who hold bitter rust from the, from the brine of biting their tongues, who have only just begun to exist, they just want to be young, but can't, because they don't fit the creed and they've never seen someone who looks like them succeed. A cycle of the self-preservation kind dines on the demolished dreams of suppressed minds and any success is expressed as anxious rigidity, an impulse to think about the, about the robberies of fraud and validity. I see now in my students features I never saw in my teachers. I'm gonna give us a round of applause because we are now what no one was. Thank you. So before we go out and march, I would like to introduce Rajni Eddins to come up here. He's a spoken word poet and a musical artist who's very popular in Vermont. Thank you. Lynching is not dead. It's done in broad daylight, under the hot lights of media frenzy, for black blood, white guilt, white fear, and white acquittal, where brown boys are still expendable. 
Michael Vick should have had Zimmerman's lawyer. Brown boys are worth less than black dogs. Trayvon should have been a brown lab. Maybe then we'd see more of a humane society's presence. If poems could march in the streets, overturn verdicts, bring corrupt police to justice, if they could bring a boy back his life and a mother back her son, a father back his boy, return bullets to a gun, unloose the lynch rope and unravel the knots from choked throats, we would not be choking on tears. When do our lives become valuable? In the eyes of the law. When does haste cease to be exonerated behind a badge and lighter skin? And God forbid you wear a hoodie in the rain while having black skin with Skittles in your pocket. You can taste the rainbow, but you can't taste freedom. You can taste your own blood, but you can't taste the rainbow. Diversity is white people's code word for niggers. You can taste the rainbow, but not if you're too dark. The rainbow may come during the storm. If you're too dark on a block, in a hoodie, and the Skittles fall from your pocket, you never taste the rainbow. Your killer has the right to stand his ground. He may shoot you in the heart, and America may relive it in sordid detail. She is only reliving her nightmares. She dreams nightmares often. Open caskets, ashes, weighted limbs, no coffins. Two, his name is George Floyd. Say it. George Floyd. Ahmaud Arbery. Arbery. Breonna Taylor. Taylor. Trayvon Martin. Renee Davis, Renee Davis. Khalif Browder, Khalif Browder. Corey, Jones. Corey Jones, Freddie Gray, Gray. Daron Small. Small, Terrence Sterling, Terrence Crutcher, D. Wiggum, Keith Lamont Scott, Keith Lamont Scott. Darren, Seals. Darren Seals, Alfred Alongo, DeAndre Joshua. Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Corin Gaines, Oscar Grant, Mackenzie Cochran, Jordan Baker, the Charleston Nine, Andy Lopez, Kimani Gray, Timothy Stanberry, Sean Bell, Sandra Bland, Natasha McKenna, Joyce Cornell, Rokina Jones, Samuel DeBose, Alicia Thomas, Tarika Wilson, Troy Good, Giovanni McDay, Benzel Hampton, Aaron Campbell, Alonzo Ashley, Renell Lewis, Wendell Allen, Tyree Woodson, Eric Garner, Eric Garner, John Crawford, Ezell Ford, Ford, Keith Vidal, Michael Brown, Brown, Jordan Davis, Jordan Davis Akai Gurley, Gurley Romaine Brisbane, Darian, Darian Hunt, Kajim Powell, Powell, Tamir Rice, Rice Usman Zongo, Manuel Loggins, Kendrick McDade, Maria Godinez, Yvette Smith, Matthew Paolo, Amadou Diallo. His name, he has a name. His name is I Can't Breathe. His name is Emmett Till. His name, his name, his name. You must remember his name. James Byrd Jr. He may whisper in the wind. You may hear it in your skin. His name is Guilty in his innocence. Freedom fighter, martyr, troublemaker. His name, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, he has a name. His name is Black Boy, blacklisted, blackballed. His name is Black Power, black babies in the black market for green cash. Stolen life, tied to a tree, burnt at the stake. His name, probable cause, the Negro problem, chalk outline, white man's fear. His name, ear for souvenir. His name, black nigger boy. Fred Hampton, Huey P. Newton, Mega Evers. His name saves lives, mobilizes movements. His name is Watch for a Black Messiah, Bullet to the Heart, Boy and Jaws of Wolf, 
white girl called rape, whistle too free, head too high. His name looked me in my eye, his name must die. Gangster, thug, menace, stereotype. His name is rest like demon. His name is take him to the Iron Bridge on Main Street. His name, his name's legs are pulling till its neck cracks. Stabbed, hung, shot, burned, ravaged by relic hunters. His name is mistaken identity. Scottsboro Boys, Tuskegee Experiments, David Walker, living, breathing black manhood. Heathen, pagan, no salvation. His name is, you free nigga, now get over it. Kunta Kinte, stolen African. Strange fruit, stranger in a strange land, in danger of deranged hands, enemy of the state, genetic the center, asphalt art, bloody memory, collateral damage, white man's burden. That happened so long ago. Chain gang, wage slave, chattel, on the rack, in the irons, on the run, wanted. His name is Arthur the Cans that felt more thistles than cotton. His name is put your hands up. Spread them. Stop or I'll shoot. His name is Bang. 41 shots. Asada Shakur. Angela Davis. Breakfast program. Black Panther Party for Self Defense. His name is, his name is, he has a name. His name is beaten severely, urinated on, chained by the ankles. His name is dragged for three miles and decapitated. 81 places have the remains. His name is missing an arm. His name is crackhead. War on drugs. War on poverty. Scapegoat. Sacrificial lamb. His name is kicked carcass. Convict. Criminal. Thief. Drug dealer. Victim. Still a child, his name will never breathe again. His name has a mother. His name is expendable. Sundown laws, Jim Crow cars, Jim Crow bars. His name is racial profiling. In court, just call him profiling, because this is not about race. <laughs> His name is Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells. No rights a white man is bound to respect. His name has a title when he dies. His name is Mr. Martin, wearer of the black hoodie, walker of the home path, wrong place, wrong time. Wrong skin, wrong crime. His name is Holder of the Skittles. His name, his mother knows his name. Her tears spell it in big, bold letters down her cheeks. His name is gone too soon. His name is Darky, Spook, Jigaboo, Sambo. His name is different. Too difficult to be pronounced by thin lips with forked tongues. His name dies without justice. Missing, lost, bottom of the ocean. Shark food, triangle trade of littered bones. His name is Sunchild, star fruit, young, gifted, and black, but you can call him nigger. His name, he has a name. His name is the sun is rising. His name is wake up! I know his name because his name is mine. So now we're gonna take the streets and march. Um, there's a banner that says Honor Black Lives, so everybody has to line up behind the banner. It's, if you turn around, they're holding it up and showing you. Um, and JoJo is gonna sing us off into the streets by a song in the movie Harriet, it's called Stand Up. Is that gonna be a Shoulders, a bullet in my gun. 
Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head Just in case I have to run I do what I can when I can while I can for my people While the clouds roll back and the stars feel the night That's when I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together we are going to a brand new home Far across the river Do you hear freedom calling? Calling me to answer Gonna keep on keeping on I can feel it in my bones Take my people 